those uh, three songs you've just sang are really trying to summarize the psalm I'm going to read for you in Psalm 116. Uh, a little bit different way, the psalmist goes at it a little bit differently than what we just did, but still trying to capture the same idea but behind why uh, we should be thanking God. And thanking God is really less about our circumstances and more about who God is. And so in those songs, we were singing about God's goodness. In that first one, talking about just the struggles of life, and yet we can still sing of God's goodness and praise God because He's there with us. He's willing to be that lighthouse, that one we can count on. And through all that and through all of our songs, we're really kind of focusing on who it is that God is And when we focus on who God is, it makes it easier for us to be able to be thankful. Because that's throughout Scripture, interwoven throughout the pages of Scripture from the beginning to the end. Scripture is classifying us as God's people, as thankful people. That should be a character trait, a characteristic that people see in us. If we are God's committed people, they should see thankful people in us. And so while we as a country are spending uh, a day each year of Thanksgiving where you'll gather with family and friends to be around a meal and and hopefully give thanks for not just that meal, of course, but really be thankful for uh, all that you have, all that God's blessed you with. And everybody does that a little bit different. All kinds of family gatherings, you all have your own traditions. But that shouldn't be something we just do once in a while as Christian people. Really, what we're talking about this morning is something we should do every single Sunday. In fact, it's something we're called to do every, not just Sunday, but every day, really, in showing God our thankfulness. And the psalmist is going to kind of outline that for us, and then we're going to talk about how do we do that? How do we show our thankfulness to God? Not just, you know, one time of year, but uh, our lives. How do we make that something that characterizes who we are? So I'm going to read Psalm 116 for you, but if you were here last week, you heard me read read out of Colossians uh, chapter 3 as we ended our uh, time in the family project. And in that letter that that Paul was writing, he kind of ends the the section that we read last week this way. This isn't the scripture we'll be looking at, but to show you that it's woven throughout all of scripture— Paul says this in verse 15 of chapter 3. I read this for you last week. I'm just reminding you of what I read. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude with your hearts. I hope that's what you did this morning. We sang to God, I hope, with gratitude in our hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All that you do, giving thanks to God the Father through through Jesus. That's what the psalmist is going to be telling us. How, How we do that, all that we do, is about giving thanks to God. This isn't just something that we read in Psalms, although the Psalms are filled with thanksgiving. There are specific Psalms called thanksgiving Psalms that were written specifically for this reason, that were either sung or were read at a worship service of some kind. But all throughout Scripture we hear that God's people are to be thankful, and there's good reason for us to be thankful. And that good reason is usually when we are focusing on God as opposed to what our circumstances are. And and the psalm is going to highlight that part of being able to be thankful regardless of, of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So thanksgiving and being thankful is just something that we try and teach our children from a very young age. You probably were taught that, how to say thank you, and that it's important for you to say thank you, and we teach our kids that, and actually there are studies that are done. Harvard did a study on people who are thankful, people who are grateful, we'll use that word, They tend to have a more positive outlook on life. They tend to have a more positive attitude when faced with adversity in some way. 
They tend to have a better quality of life. These are studies that they've done with people who are thankful. They've done a study where one group of people uh, wrote down all the irritations from the past week. So starting today until Saturday, imagine writing down all your irritations, everything that irritated you this past week, your wife or your husband that irritated you, your kids were irritating you, your mom or your dad was irritating you. All week long, you're writing down those irritations. And then another group of people were looking for ways to thank people. So one of the things they were given to do, a task to do for the week, was think of somebody either in your life or somebody you know, maybe not a friend or a family, that you think ha- needs to be thanked. They, they go, they do stuff, and they don't receive the thanks that they deserve. And so you're supposed to write them a note. And so they did that. And then they kind of followed them, and they showed the quality of life of this person that looked for somebody to thank, and the quality of life of this person or these people that were writing down all the irritations. And it was dramatically different. And really, the, the thankfulness or the gratitude that these, this group of people were expressing had profound effects months beyond them actually writing down that note. It was well beyond that week, or that week was better. Their attitude when they asked a series of questions was better. But it was actually months that things were better for them because they were being thankful. So science is proving for us that being thankful is important. Psychology is telling us that. And I'm doing my own little experiment here with all of you to see what words you know in a different language. Okay, does anybody know what this word is and what language it is? It's German. And so you'd say Danke in German. Or Danke schön, depending on what German class you were in, which is thank you beautifully. How about this one? That's Spanish. Say it. You can't just tell me the language. You got to say the word. Okay. How about this language? And that is French. Jap- only because you know the song. Arigato, Mr. Rabato, or whatever it is. Japanese, yeah. yeah. This one was much longer. I just cut it short because we knew this one. I didn't know the rest of what it was saying. How about this one? Italian, yes. Thank you. Very slimmer. Now, this, this next one is probably going to date you if you know this, because maybe you took this language in school. What would you say? Latin, yeah. They don't, I mean, they don't teach that in school anymore, but it's very similar to the Spanish and Italian, because, of course, those were the, that's where those languages are coming from. How about this one? Russian. Russian. What, what do you guys, Google this stuff back there or what? You got the Rosetta Stone that you listen to on the way to church? Spasibo. This is Russian, although when I was in Ukraine, this is how we uh, thanked people. They used this word. But So any of you fluent in any of these languages? What? English? And even that you struggle with. No. So, but, but all these languages, you know the word thank you. This is, if you go to any of these countries, you could at least be able to tell somebody thank you. And it's just something that we do, and that's probably one of the first words you learn if you know you're flying somewhere, leaving the States. You probably learn this word because you want to be able to thank somebody. There's just something important about being able to thank people. You don't even know any of these languages, but you know thank you in that language. And I think that's just telling us that this is a big part of what it means to be human, to be thankful, and an important part. And science is now telling us that it's actually healthier for us to be thankful. And I think God was on to something from Genesis to Revelation telling God's people, hey, it's important for you to be a thankful people, to be appreciative, to be grateful for what you have. And it's not fun being around people that aren't very thankful. And you've probably made comments about people, something you probably did nice for them, and you never got a thank you. You've, you've done all these kinds of things, and you don't even need money for it. All you're looking for is a thank you. And it says something about that person if they can't even bring themselves to say thank you for something. I hope that's not you. The psalmist is actually going to highlight the importance of being thankful and the importance of being thankful even when our situation says you have no reason to really be thankful for anything. 
but the psalmist is saying that's probably maybe the most important time to be thankful. So I'm going to read that for you. It's Psalm 116. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. And it's talking about a situation. We don't know exactly what the situation is, but scholars know the situation that the psalmist is talking about is one in which he thought he was going to die. He was in a tough place, and he wasn't sure he was going to make it out of there. He was like the prey, and death was the attacker searching for him, and he thought he was as good as dead. And so he's, he's writing this psalm. He's writing this prayer or this song uh, that would have been sung about his situation. And it's talking about being thankful. That, that's how he kind of ends this whole thing. But his situation, we, though we don't know what it was, is one in which I'm not sure why you're very thankful when you're in the midst of this situation. And so he's going to challenge the reader, the hearer, the one who hears this story of his to actually join him in thanksgiving. So he starts out in this way with whatever situation he found himself in, and he's kind of reflecting on it now, thinking back to that moment in his life where he thought he was as good as gone. He says in verse 1 of Psalm 116, I love the Lord, He heard, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy, because he turned his ear to me. I call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. So whatever his situation was, it was a pretty grim outcome, he thought. He was overcome by distress and sorrow. And in that moment, he cried out to the Lord, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, your, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living, the opposite of the land of the dead, where God is not. In Old Testament theology, this is Sheol, is the name that is used, and that is the land of the dead. The land of the dead was out to get him like I said, he, they were throwing, it says about entangling him. It was like the land of the day was throwing the ropes around him, pulling him down. He didn't want to go there because God is not there. That's not where God's presence is. So he's saying, thank you, God, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. He survived whatever the situation was, and now he's writing this song, we'll say, about that. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I'm in verse 10, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. So it's clear from verse 3 that whatever the situation was, he was pretty sure he wasn't going to come through. And so he is... We were reading where the psalmist went. This is a question for all of us. When life is tough, where do you go? Where do you turn when life is at its worst? For the psalmist, he turned to God because of what he believed about God. So his situation was, was dire, and so he calls out to God. And he did that because of a couple of things. And again, when he is ending his song here, with thanksgiving, all the things he's going to do to praise God for his goodness, what we find in the psalm is that his focus was not simply on the cords of death that entangled him, but on God's goodness. And so because he knows God's goodness, he calls out to God. Because God was the only one he believed that could respond, and he believed God indeed would respond. And so we see in verse 1, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, 
I will call on him as long as I live. The psalmist, at least, believes that this is how God responds. This is what he believes about God when he calls out to God, that God is going to pay attention to his need, that God is involved in his life, God is not distant from him, and he believes that God will act on his behalf. I mean, he says it, Then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord save me. So when he calls out on God, actually what the scripture is saying is that God bends his ear towards the psalmist. He believes that God is actually paying attention to him, and he believes that God is willing to be involved in his life, and he doesn't think he's praying to some God that is out there somewhere too far away to even hear me. And sometimes we ourselves get into that place where we wonder if even our prayers are leaving the room because we don't think God is listening. We don't think God hears. God seems to be very distant from us. And he even believes that God will act on our behalf. He will act in human history. So when life is at its toughest, when we're in those difficult situations, the psalmist is saying, I can thank God for his goodness because he's going to hear me and he's going to do something and I believe he's going to act on my behalf. And even in the midst of this difficult situation, I believe that God is there with me. So that's an important piece to, to remember. Because if, if thankfulness doesn't come because God's blessed me in some way, my current family situation is what I want it to be. Remember, we talked about the imperfect family. Maybe yours is really imperfect. Do I still have reason to thank God? Maybe things aren't the greatest in your life with your job, with another relationship, maybe financially, maybe physically, and you're just wondering if God hears you. Well, the psalmist is saying he does, and as God's committed people, he's inviting everybody that would have heard this. Maybe he shared the story with the group of people that's gathered to tell them what happened, and all we got is the song that they wrote and sang together because of God's goodness and reasons to be thankful. And so we can never say about God what maybe sometimes we hear. Did you even hear a word that I said? Do you hear that ever? Are you even paying attention to what I said? Jess isn't in here. Is she good? Yes, I hear that. No, I didn't hear a word that you said. You've probably heard that. You haven't paid attention sometimes. Okay, guys, you know that. Are you paying attention now? We can never say that about God. Did you even hear what I said, God? The answer is yes. At least that's what the psalmist believes. And as a follower of Jesus, I believe that as well. There's a reason to be thankful that God, in fact, hears our prayers. God, in fact, will get involved in our lives. God is not out there somewhere. He is near to us, and he will act on our behalf. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. Maybe we don't get what's going on in our life, but God indeed will do this. At the very least, we can say, yes, God has done this. Because we're about to celebrate God doing this when he put on flesh. We call it the incarnation. We call it uh, Christmas. God was not distant. He was paying attention, even when they thought he was gone. And they hadn't heard from God in over 400 years. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene and starts preaching a message about God's intervention. God was attentive to everything that was happening. God was involved, as we read through all of the Old Testament. We see God's involvement in all of that. And God certainly was not distant from his people. He actually dwelled with his people. And God most certainly acted on their behalf when he broke into human history and put on flesh. And we celebrate the birth of that baby. That is what God is doing. Psalm 116 can be read in light of the cross. Yes, God did save every single one of us. Maybe not from the the particular circumstance you're in right now, but he certainly has saved you from your sin and rebellion against him. In some traditions, this psalm is actually read on Holy Thursday in connection with the Lord's Supper. We're going to do something this year that we haven't done before at Grace Church. We're going to have a Seder meal here in our fellowship hall. And that meal is 
is kind of describing the meal that we that the that Jesus and the disciples would have had together, and that meal ends with communion. And we're going to have a, a messianic Jew, a, a Jew that believes in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, come, and he's going to he's going to share that that message in that dinner with us to to talk about what it is that God has done. And in some traditions, this psalm is actually read because now that God has most clearly intervened on our behalf, most clearly acted and delivered and saved us on our behalf, we can read Psalm 116 and we can say yes to this question. Or we can say yes, that God indeed is this way. He has proven himself worthy of this because, as the psalmist says, now he's in a a terrible place. His circumstances stink. His life is about to end. He is overcome with distress and sorrow, anguish, and the grave is overcoming me, and the cords of death have entangled me. In verse 5, he says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Now, the NIV translation uses the term righteous. Other translations use the term faithful. It's the same Hebrew word. And so when you have the same Hebrew word, we have to figure out what the context is. Which word in Hebrew, because it's the same, fits best in this situation. The NIV translator said, we think righteousness fits best, and they have their reasons for that. The Good News Bible or Good News Translation says faithful. Maybe, depending on what translation you have, says faithfulness or righteousness. I think, personally, that faithfulness fits best in this, that Hebrew word, fits best in the, in the psalmist's song here. The Lord is gracious and faithful because God has made a lot of promises to his people, to his followers. And he has proven, at least in this person's situation, proven himself faithful to the promises that he's made. And so the focus is not the distress in which he finds himself in. The focus becomes the Lord is gracious and faithful. Our God is full of compassion. In verse 6, it goes, The Lord protects the unwary, When I was brought low, he saved me. That protects the unwary, again, is a pretty difficult translation. And it's talking about this simple faith that people have. Uh, Some translators use helpless. But it's just this, this faith, this simple faith of a child who believes mom and dad are going to protect me. Mom and dad are going to do all of this for me. And they just naturally think that because that's what mom and dad's supposed to do. The psalmist is is kind of saying that same thing. He just naturally thinks this because that's what God does. And so the focus doesn't become on his, doesn't stay on his circumstances. It actually focuses in on God's goodness. We're going to use all of these attributes with one big umbrella term, which is God's goodness. The psalmist is thanking God for his goodness. When there was no one that he could turn to, In the midst of his distress, his affliction, he says in verse 10, I trusted in the Lord when I said I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said everyone is a liar. Basically saying there was no one he could turn to. But he knew one place that he could go, and that was to God. And there's times in our life where that is indeed the case. There's situations that we find ourselves in. As much as I want to be there for my wife, sometimes she says, Ted, did you even hear what I said? And I say no. And sometimes I'm just not there the way that I should be there for them. And I can't. But the psalmist says there's one person we can go to that is always there. He's never too busy to hear what we have to say. In fact, he bends his ear toward us. That's the kind of God he is praying to. That's the kind of God who has revealed himself to us through the scriptures. That's the kind of God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, where he was always ready and willing to hear that person everybody else forgot about and to act on their behalf. And at the very least, we can say, yes, God is faithful to this. We have seen God's goodness that his love is never-ending. Even in my own rebellion, 
even in my own, I know better than you, God. Even in my own, I'm going to take this way instead of the way that you said, God. Even in my own sin, God's love is never ending because he calls us back to himself and Jesus has saved us from ourselves sometimes. So the psalmist is trying to get everybody, he's inviting everybody, he's inviting you and me into praising God for his goodness, into thanking God for his goodness because he says the Lord is gracious and righteous or faithful. Our God is full of compassion. He's inviting us to recognize that. That's our God. That's not just his God. That's our God. If you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ, you can say that same thing, and he is inviting you to say it. And so the invitation is for all of us, not just him who actually experienced whatever the turmoil was and came out of it. The invitation is for all of us as well. What is your circumstance currently? He is inviting you to say our God is gracious and faithful. He is full of compassion, and he will intervene on our behalf. He will protect. He will save. He's inviting us to believe that, and he believes that so much so but he wants to give a public expression of that. So we might be able to classify this song or prayer as a foxhole prayer. Anybody ever heard of that term? Foxhole prayer? No? Yes? Maybe? So the, the, the analogy is you're in the foxhole, you're in this same situation, and you say, God, if you get me out of this, Oh boy, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll do all the things you want me to do. I just save me from this. And we call it the foxhole prayer because the bombs are falling. You're in your foxhole and you think you're about to, to meet your maker. And so you don't want to. And so here comes the prayer. God, if you get me out of this, I promise X, Y, and Z. Now, you don't have to be in a foxhole to pray that. Maybe you've prayed that. Maybe you've been in a situation where it's, God, if you just save me from this, I've prayed it when I was in the Navy. I wasn't in, in death. There was other situations like, God, oh, just get me out of this. I really messed up. And if you do, I'll see you in church on Sunday. And then that lasts for so long, and then, you know, you forget. You forget about that. So he's saying that's what he prayed. And so what he says is, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness? In verse 12, he is going to make good on the vows that he made to God. God, I have experienced your goodness, and I cannot keep that to myself. i got to make sure I thank you, and I'm going to do that in front of everybody else so they can thank you too, and so that we together can give you praise for your goodness to us. Certainly, that's why we gather every Sunday. You and I gathering in this place every Sunday is giving thanks to God for doing this for us in Jesus Christ. We have reason to be thankful because God has saved us. We can lift that cup of salvation that the psalmist uses that term. It's a wine offering. It was a specific cup. That's why they use it at the meal at the Holy Thursday on, the, on Holy Week. We can say that every Sunday we come into this place. You could say that every day you wake up because God has done that in Jesus Christ. And so the psalmist wants to give thanksgiving to God, and that's what we're going to talk about. How do we do that? If you are a committed follower of God's, and that should be a part of our life, you should be thankful. We should be showing God thankfulness for all of his goodness, and so the psalmist gives his idea of that thankfulness. He asks the question to himself, and we could plug ourselves in there, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? You can ask yourself that question. Okay, God, what shall I return? What can I return to you for all of your goodness to me? Now, he's not saying if your circumstances are good, if you're happy with where you're at in life right now, if you've had a good week at the stock market, if your job is better, if your family's perfect. He didn't say, what shall I return to the Lord for all of his goodness to me based upon the circumstance that I'm in? He wants to do that because in his affliction, at his deepest, darkest moment, he says in uh, verse 10, I trusted the Lord when I said I am greatly afflicted. In the midst of that circumstance, his response was not, woe is me, God. 
his response was not, okay, God, if you're supposedly gracious and kind and full of compassion and you're wanting to intervene in my life, why am I in the current circumstance that I'm in? You must not care about me. There's a lot of people, based upon their circumstances, determines what they believe about God and whether or not they're willing to follow this God. This psalmist is saying, regardless of whatever circumstance you find yourself in, all of us, as God's people, committed followers of His, should be able to say, verse 12, any moment of any day, what shall I return to the Lord for all of His goodness to me? And then he gives some ideas of what he's going to do. Lift up that cup of salvation. He's going to give this offering, and he's going to call on the name of the Lord. Whatever he said to God, I'm going to fulfill my vows in the presence of his people. I'm going to tell everybody what God did on my behalf, and I'm going to, I'm going to thank God for that in the presence of his people. As a committed follower of God's, I'm going to, be, uh, I'm going to share what God does for his people. That's what the language is there in verse 15. In 16, talking about, I serve you just as my mother did. This isn't like a new faith. He is a part of God's family, and so he wants to be among God's family and give praise to God and thank him. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call in the name of the Lord. He's basically saying, in front of anybody who is willing to listen, God, I'm going to thank you for what you've done. So because of God's goodness, what can we offer him? We didn't, I didn't bring any wine to give an offering to God. I didn't bring anything to sacrifice to God. We don't really do that in that way anymore. He was using terminology, language that would have been familiar with everybody hearing this, praying it, singing it. So what do we do? How do we offer our, give our offerings or sacrifices? What are some things that you and I can do to say thank you to God for his goodness to us? And the, the, the language we use in the church, oftentimes, maybe you've heard this before, lots of people have said this, this isn't original with me, we talk about time, talent, and treasure. As a thank you to God for His goodness to us, we're willing to offer something back to God. So every Sunday you're here, we are offering God our, our voices, we're singing, and hopefully you're singing, and hopefully you've got that gratitude in your heart when you're doing that. That's kind of what that verse in Colossians was saying. Every Sunday you're here, we don't make a big deal about it, but every Sunday you're here, the ushers come around and they take your offering. That's what we call it. If you grew up in the church, that's what it's called, offering. We're doing the same thing that he did. We're just doing it in a different way. We're saying this treasure that I have, my money, God, is an offering to you. We're thanking God for that. So this mundane thing that happens every Sunday, when the usher comes around and you see the plate coming before you, is your way of saying thank you to God. This is a public expression of showing your thankfulness. And Paul, again, I said this is woven throughout all of Scripture. It's not just in the Old Testament. It's not just in the Psalms. Paul was talking about this very issue, this very thing, with another church that lived in the city of Corinth. And he said this to them in this letter that the church would have been reading out loud to everybody. Remember this, everybody in the church. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. That's what God loves. And Paul's expectation is that we would be those cheerful givers because we understand God's goodness to us, and out of that overwhelming, overwhelming sense of thankfulness, we give back to God. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, but with gratitude. And so that's why we, we give our offerings. And for some people, it is a sacrifice. Some people don't have that much. And they are basically saying to God when they either put their envelope in or put that $10 bill in or whatever they're giving, I don't have much, God, but what I have, I'm giving back to you as a way to publicly say thank you. When I was uh, preaching in Hazleton at uh, Buenos Nuevos Church, uh, it's primarily people from the Dominican Republic, but it's a Spanish-speaking church, so when I preached my message, there was a translator there uh, sharing that message in Spanish. But the way that they took offering in their church, 
Somebody was up here playing the piano, and they had a couple of people standing up here with a basket. And so usually what happened as I'm observing this, husband and wife got up, came up to the front, and put their offering in the basket. If they had some kids with them, the family came up, and they put their offering in the basket. It was their public declaration to say, thank you, God, for what you've given to me. And Paul is saying, our cheerfulness in that gift impacts the way we view our treasure. And it does impact the way we view our life and our family. Now, Paul doesn't specifically say this, but I'm going to relate that same kind of mindset to the time and the talent piece. It's one thing to pray that prayer in the foxhole and say, okay, God, you get me out of this. Oh, I promise to do this and do that and do this. And it's one thing for you to just say that to God. Remember what I read for you in Colossians, Paul says, in word and deed. The expectation is that we will publicly, as the psalmist is saying, is an important part of being thankful. We will publicly say, thank you, God. And we do that not of obligation or begrudgingly. We do that because we are indeed thankful. It's actually there. It exists in our heart. It's not just made up. And I'm suggesting that we do that with our time and we do that with our talent as well. There's a lot of people that give a lot of time at Grace Church. And that is an offering to God. That is a sacrifice to God. That is you saying, at least that's how I view it as the pastor, that is you saying, I'm thankful to God. I'm going to give back to Him. There's a lot of stuff that happens at this church that wouldn't happen unless somebody said that. And they gave a lot of time and energy and make some sacrifices for that. that that's a public expression of saying thanks to God. There's a lot of people that give talent back to the church. We couldn't afford all the things that everybody does at this church. There's no way. We just don't have that kind of money because a lot of the things you, many of you do, you get paid to do in other settings, and we couldn't do it. There's a lot of things many of you do that you used in October to go and help somebody else. You got some talents that other people don't have or can't afford to pay for, and as a way of thanksgiving, maybe you didn't view it this way before, but as a way of saying thank you to God, you give that talent to someone else as an offering. I'm offering this up to you, God. There's lots of, of opportunities for you to do that, for all of us to do that as God's people. If I'm a committed follower of God, then I'm going to take seriously the opportunities to offer and sacrifice to God in a public way. Because I want people to know that I am thankful. And I want God to see that. In my opinion, there is a difference between me praying that prayer to God and saying these wonderful things to God and then actually living that out. I can say anything to God and say how thankful I am, but unless I'm willing to live that out, that expression is, is really not seen by anyone else. How, how do people know that I'm thankful? I show up in these places, and you do these things as an expression of thanks to God. So maybe we're not offering the same things that the psalmist is offering, but we certainly have the same opportunity to offer time and talent and treasure back to God as a way of saying thank you. Thank you, God, for blessing me. Thank you, God, for caring for my family. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for your goodness to God. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances. Paul didn't say... If you make X amount of dollars, then you should give back to God and be generous and be cheerful. If you have X amount of time, then you should give back to God and give this much time and be cheerful. Every single one of us has a reason to be thankful. It is one of the key components that we try and teach our children or that your parents try to teach you. That is why the first words we teach our kids in English, please and thank you. I guarantee you, you're all doing that or have done it probably. And you get upset with your kids when they don't say thank you because it's teaching us something important about who we are. And you can say thank you regardless of your circumstances because we understand God's goodness. And God gives us the opportunity to offer things back to Him, to say, in the presence of your people, God, I'm going to give you thanks. As one of your committed followers, I'm going to give you thanks. 
And so he gave a public expression. Whatever this scenario was, maybe he shared the story with everybody, but this was, he's talking about going to the temple. That's where everybody would have gathered and give public expression. When you were giving a sacrifice, you didn't just do that in your own home where nobody was watching. You did that at the altar that was at the temple. This is a public thing that is happening. You do that every Sunday if you come to church. Your attendance at a worship service, maybe you've never viewed it this way before, but this is a public expression of you being thankful to God. Maybe your week stank this past week, and you're not looking forward to this week. When you show up on a Sunday, you still have reason to give public thanks to God. God is still good in the midst of my circumstances, and I want to make sure he knows that, and I want to make sure everybody else knows that. And I'm going to meet with a bunch of people that think that same way too. Your attendance, this is why the church gathers. I mean, there's a point to what we're doing. And it's not just to give Ted a job or for him to be able to talk on time on end. It has a purpose. Part of it is to do exactly what this psalmist did in Psalm 116. You are doing that. When we sing together, we are singing that. God has called his people to give public expression of his thanks. And it doesn't just end on a Sunday morning of maybe when we do that together. But it's also sharing the stories of God's goodness. In the old days, we called this testimony or testifying, bearing witness to God's goodness. We are giving recognition publicly to the goodness of God. And so hopefully, maybe you're a part of a connection group. Maybe you're a part of a life group. Maybe you're with another small group that meets on a regular basis. Hopefully, you're sharing some of these stories. We've done that before in here in this setting where some people have stood up and shared about why they're thankful to God or praised God for something. And fortunately for you, we're out of time, but I bet you many many of you, if I brought the microphone around to you and you got nervous and were able to talk, you could probably talk about God's goodness. This is an important part of who we are. We need to make sure we're doing that in situations where we're able to express thankfulness to God for His goodness to us. We try and do this in our family. I want my girls to know that God is good even in difficult situations. And so even when things are tough or the, maybe the, the situation is the best, we still thank God. Every night we sit down together and have a meal together. And you know what we go around and say? What we're thankful for. Maybe you had a terrible day today, but you can say something you're thankful for. When life is not at its best, when there's situations that you were in like the psalmist, and God brings you through that, do you remember to give thanks to God? Do you tell your family? Do you tell your children? Do you tell those around you that God was so good to me in this situation? Listen to what happened. I want to tell this story to you. This is our way of doing exactly what Psalm 116 is doing. And in that way, despite our circumstances, we can testify to, share stories about God's goodness to us. This is whatever happened in the psalmist's life. This is why he wrote this. He just wanted everybody to know God is so good. Yeah, but look what happened. Yeah, but what you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You missed the goodness of God that when nobody else was willing to listen, I could bend his ear. And we can't say of God, did you even hear what I said, God? At least according to the psalmist and the scriptures. And as committed followers of Jesus Christ, this is an expression of our commitment. We're offering back to God our whole life. You know, Thanksgiving for us isn't a day of the year. And you're going to be together with friends and family, and maybe you have your own thing that you do, and maybe you go around and be thankful or whatever, but this isn't something that just happens right before Christmas. This is who we are. This is the offering we're making. I want to encourage you to do that. If this hasn't been your mindset behind all the things that you do, I want to encourage you to change that. If you're currently in a circumstance that you wish you weren't a part of, or that you wish you weren't in, or life's just been tough, I want to encourage you to read over verse 5. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. He will act on our behalf. God hears me. 
God listens to my prayers. There is reason for us to give thanks. I mean, there is reason for us to do that in a public way, to view my time, the, the talents I have, the treasure that I have, as an offering back to God and saying, thank you, God. To be in public worship and do what we do together on Sunday mornings as us saying, thank you, God. To share those stories in the settings that you're in, whether it's with Christian people or people that could care less about God. There's plenty of people out there that aren't sitting down at a meal and saying, thank you, God, for X, Y, and Z. But then they hear your story. Why are you so thankful? Your life's a mess. That circumstance that you were in is terrible, and yet you're sitting here thanking God. There's a message behind that, and it points back to God and less on our own circumstances or situations, but points back to the reason we can be thankful people, because of God's goodness. And we celebrate that. That's what the joy about Christmas is. We celebrate that because God is so good, He broke into human history, and he actually took upon himself the punishment that we should have received. And we can read Psalm 116 in light of the cross and know that God has indeed saved us. We are indeed and should be a thankful people. Let's pray. God, thank you this morning for your goodness. And uh, we could probably begin every single prayer that we pray with those words, thank you for your goodness to us. Despite whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whatever's going on in our life, Lord God, we can still thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer and being so interested in our lives that you bend your ear toward us. And God, maybe there's a circumstance in our current situation that we're asking you to save us from, Lord. And I pray that you would hear the prayers of your people. But God, in the midst of all that, I do also pray that we could see ourselves as people who are to give thanks. And that we can do that with our time and our talent and our treasure, Lord. We can do that publicly by gathering. We can do that publicly by sharing stories of your goodness with people around us. And certainly, Lord God, we should be doing that within our own families. So they grow and learn and know and understand that despite of what's happening around us, we can give thanks for God's goodness. Lord, we do give you thanks for that this morning. And as we will gather with friends and family this week, Lord, I do pray that, that thankfulness would characterize our lives as your committed people and that our whole life would be given back to you as a way of saying thank you, God, for saving us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.